afternoon, everyone. So glad you could be here this morning. Um, looking forward to my I'm to make sure I don't press this one. This turns it on and off. I missed the clicker, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, if I may ask your indulgence as I introduce an idea and then hop, skip, and jump through a few examples. Uh, choosing a group to join or a team can usually be undone. Like, you, know, you might happen to live here uh, right now, and this is the church you're part of, but you might have been part of a church before, and if you move somewhere else, you'll be part of a church. You know, you, can, you join, you, you, you're here for the while, and you move on. You join a team, join a sports team. But there are times in life where you throw your lot in with someone, and that's it. That's, you are linked with them. Um, and whatever happens to them is going to happen to you, so you hope it's the best thing that can happen. Uh, so I, uh, you know, you know it's all been almost a year uh, since Richard left us, and I am not au, au fait with all of Lord of the Rings and all that, so I just, but I, in uh, Richard's memory, not that he's gone, but he's just not here. Um, <laughs> uh, if, if you know Lord of the Rings, I was uh, recently watching it, and I, you know, I'll just show you how much I'm not Richard. I didn't read it. I just watched it. Uh, I, uh, Mary and Pippin are having this discussion about all the turmoil that's going on and they're at the, pl the place where they can finally go back to the Shire and, and one of them, I don't even know which one, one of them saying, let's, let's go back to the Shire where everything's okay and we can just, you know, you basically close our eyes, cover our ears and everything's going to be fine. And um, Pippin says to Mary, whichever, uh, you, don't you understand we have to stay? Like, what happens to them affects us. We have to stay with mankind and not go back to hobbit kind. And, and because what, what happens here matters to us. And so they throw their lot in with mankind and fight the battles and are ultimately successful. Uh, but in the Bible, we have uh, Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. He had the opportunity to stay in Pharaoh's palace. He had uh, opportunity for many... Uh, uh, Hebrews tells us many sinful indulgences, but he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. The short-term uh, pleasure of sin, he chose the suffering with the people of Israel. Um, <clears throat> and he also, uh, we have the example of Ruth, who even though her husband had died, and she, she followed her mother-in-law back to a country that was not Ruth's. It was, she left her own country, Moab, to go to Israel in order to, to stay with, with Naomi. She said, you know, a very emphatic, whatever happens to you happens to me. You are, you are my fate. I will be with your people I will, you know, until death. This is, this is my choice. Uh, Ruth made that decision. The uh, <clears throat> fictional character, Judah Ben-Hur, again, in another movie, he, uh, he has the opportunity before Pilate. He has been adopted as the son of a general and uh, high up Roman, but, but he, he has the opportunity before Pilate to accept the citizenship of Rome and be a free Roman citizen. And he refuses it and says, I'd rather be part of my people, just like Moses had before uh, in, in reality, that character does in the movie. Um, another real life example uh, uh, in our own history, uh, in Holland after the German invasion in World War II, uh, um, there's a family called the Ten Booms. If you've heard of Corrie Ten Boom, uh, she was made famous uh, because of what God used her for during during the war. Uh, was that her her house became a way station in the Underground Railroad that were getting uh, mainly Jews, but also just resistance fighters and uh, <clears throat> people people who were resisting the Nazis. They they had needed a way to navigate and get through and so they they their house became a waste stop they were not going to refuse anyone was what the father said in fact so much so that under this oppression and this evil that had had taken over their country uh the papa tembum casper tembum when the jew uh, the jews were required to have a, a yellow star um, sewn onto their clothes where to identify them as jews uh casper tembum even though he wasn't a jew by by uh, either heritage or religion decided to, to get a, a yellow star. He voluntarily wore that yellow star to, to throw his lot in with the people of God who were suffering at that time. And uh, when you make a decision like that, you're giving up the rights and the freedoms and the protections 
uh, of those in those examples, giving up the protections that you'd have otherwise. And you're, you're saying, what their fate is, my fate is too. And from those examples, I would like to um, <clears throat> draw your attention to this passage in Daniel chapter 9. Now, I don't have it on the slides, but it's in the Pew Bibles. It's on page 894 uh, if you're looking for Daniel chapter 9. Um, we're, we're looking for uh, the example, the prayer life of this man, uh, Daniel, as he... Um, commits commits uh, with others. Do I need to move this? Is that better? We're good. We're good. Okay. <clears throat> um, especially in times of peril, our survival instinct may point us towards uh, using our every advantage of separation. Uh, but these noble examples show how committing uh, to share the fate of others by identifying with them, we can make a difference. Uh, Daniel was a righteous man who identified with and interceded for his unrighteous peers. His example shows that people who deserve the wrath of God for refusing his direction and refusal to repent can receive mercy because of an intercessor. You must intercede to God for others because God will answer with mercy. Uh, so I'm going to start reading here in Daniel chapter. I'm just going to go through the whole thing. So all 27 verses. It won't, won't take any longer for the sermon, don't worry. Um, but let's just uh, read through this whole chapter. So in the first year of Darius of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler of the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jer Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, to our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our, our unfaithfulness to you. O Lord, and, and we and our kings, our princes and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us. Uh, through his servants, the prophets, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done in Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all the disasters come upon us, and yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger. <clears throat> turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill, our sins and, in, and the iniquities of our fathers that made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, uh, with, uh, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, and the sin of my people, Israel, and making request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, 
While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen earlier in the, in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you, uh, you began to pray, an answer was given, uh, which I have come to tell you. For you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to be fini- finish, uh, for your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. No one understand from the issuing of the, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and six, 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, and, but in times of trouble. After 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and have, will have nothing. And the people, of, <clears throat> the people of the ruler who will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue and end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination, cause desolation, until the end is decreed and poured on, out on him. <clears throat> so, again, a long passage. I wouldn't normally present something so long, but uh, there are basically two halves to, in this Daniel prays, Daniel gets his answer. We're not focusing on the content of the answer this morning. We're, we're looking at the fact that he prayed, the fact that he interceded to God for others uh, because God will answer with mercy. You go through uh, the, uh, the brief overview of the history um, of, of what uh, was happening here. About you know, 15th century B.C., Moses brings Israel out of Egypt. They conquer the land under Joshua. They're settled. Uh, runs for about 400 years, and those 400 years are uh, with judges, and then around 1000 BC, uh, King Saul is set up, then David, then Solomon. Solomon builds the temple. When he dedicates the temple, he asks the Lord if, if anyone sins, and then they, they face towards the temple and they pray that God would forgive their sins, especially if they had broken the law, the law in such a way that they had been scattered, that they would pray towards the temple and God would forgive them. Uh, because when God was bringing them into the land, Moses made very clear, there's a, a, a blessing and a curse. The blessing is, if you follow the Lord, I'll give you life, I'll pr- prosper you. This is the land I'm giving you, it'll be fruitful. I'll protect you from your enemies. But if you disobey me, I'll, I'll judge you so that people know the, what righteousness is. And Israel very, very uniquely was set up uh, to receive those blessings and those curses based on their, their obedience to the covenant. They disobeyed the covenant for many, many years. God sent prophets, God uh, uh, gave them more scripture, reminded them of the covenant. Uh, he he sent, sent other nations to... to, to <clears throat> Uh, distress them uh, around about, but eventually the northern kingdom, uh, as they divided, was sent into cap- captivity in around uh, the eighth century BC. And then, uh, coming up on the sixth century BC, finally Babylon co- conquers Jerusalem, takes Judah, and fully destroys it in 586 BC. Uh, Daniel was part of the, the, the group of people that were transferred from, from Jerusalem to Babylon and were uh, invested with uh, all of the knowledge and the uh, executive uh, abilities and administrative abilities uh, because he was, was an intelligent and uh, respectable ca- uh, captive. So they wanted him to, to, to use him to the most ability that they could and he rose in power. Uh, but very clearly throughout his life, we're in Daniel chapter 9 here towards the end of his life, but as a young man, he, he refused to eat the, the food that was, was not kosher. He asked instead if he could, he, if he could eat the, uh, uh, just, just vegetables so that he wouldn't have to, to defile himself with the king's meat. He, he, he lived a life of dedication to the Lord. And we, we heard a sem- sermon not, uh, just a few weeks ago about how Daniel was caught in a trap because they knew he would pray towards Jerusalem. There was no way around it. He was definitely going to pray towards Jerusalem. So how are you going to 
catch, catch Daniel, trip him up, only in respect to his God. In obedience to his God, that's how you trip him up. So his life was impeccable. You know, we have, there are a few examples in his, uh, in, 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 throughout Scripture of someone as we're going through their life where they don't mistake, make mistakes or slip up or sin. You know, as much as we love David as, as an example, there are very clear examples of sin in his life. Daniel's not one of them. Um, Joseph being another. And uh, we, as we look at this life, you could say of anyone who could, who could say they have sinned and pray for them, it would be Daniel. But that's not how he approached this. He said, we have sinned. We have sinned. And he took on him as he was praying the identity of the sinners. We have sinned. Um, often um, there, but for the grace of God, go I is an old phrase. Uh, although it does express humility and reveal, it still reveals a distinction that we have made. Yes, I am no better than that person, but I'm on a different path than that person now, aren't I? The level of intercession that Daniel models for us removes that separation. He did not pray for mercy because they have sinned, but because we have sinned. Daniel very clearly had spent his life paying a lot of attention to what God had said, but, there, uh, but here he confesses the sin of ignoring God's word with the rest of the Jews. Daniel's unreserved identification with all of Israel in their offenses before God is a distinct level of intercession. Just, um, I'm just going to point out as well, even though he was identifying with their sin, he was not, um, <clears throat> as some people like today, oh, I, I have to be all things to all men and, and embrace everyone where they're at by celebrating their sin or saying that's okay. That's not what Daniel did. He said, we are guilty of this sin and we need to stop it and change. And if, if in, I'm thinking distinctly of, of certain sin that people have dedicated a month to, uh, you know, we don't celebrate that. That's not something we celebrate. But we, ident in identifying with, with other sinners and asking for mercy, we don't celebrate the sin, just as, as Daniel didn't. But take on, uh, on instead the level of guilt and, and um, deserving wrath uh, that that position earns. Uh, you may before have been moved to ask God to be merciful to them for their sins. But have you ever prayed for us to be delivered? What's the difference? If, if God doesn't deliver them, then they languish in death and destruction of sin's penalty. But it, if God doesn't show mercy to us, then that's your fate too. That's a different position in your prayer before the Lord. I am I'm praying for God to deliver us. Even as imperfect Christian Christians, some sins are more repulsive to us than others. And so standing with someone in their guilt is distasteful, but consider Christ. As we learn. Uh, that Christ, uh, who instead of the joy who was, that was set before him, uh, he set it aside and endured the cross, despising the shame. He is the ultimate example of identifying with sinners who he himself had never sinned and took on himself the form of a servant. He made himself human so that he could suffer for humanity. And he paid the price for our sin, even though he had no sin himself. So he, he endured God's wrath. Just like Daniel here is saying, we deserve this wrath. Um, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> prayer of Daniel as you go through there, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant um, uh, with all love, uh, uh, with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. And towards the end, uh, you are righteous, O Lord. That you need to acknowledge God's righteous. If there's, there's no uh, way out of facing the, the penalty of sin. Either we pay for it ourselves or, or we accept that Christ paid the price. There's no short circuit. There's no, there's no get out of jail free card. This is, this is either, it has to be paid for. And sin not only has uh, consequences in eternity, sin has consequences now. 
God sends often, often judgments. Sometimes it's just built in. Just built, sin by its very nature separates you from, from relationships or hurts other people, and so there's a withdrawal. Uh, sin by its very nature is destructive, and so you engage in certain types of addictions, and, and it destroys your body. You know, there are just sins that are, have consequences built in, but sometimes in addition to that, God visits a people with, with, uh, or individuals with judgment based on their sins. And that's, that's the right thing to do. We'd, all, we'd like to say, oh, well, well, God's not really like that. There is no real, uh, it's awkward. I, I don't really want to come out and say, but God judges sin. And he's right when he does it. It's never any more than is deserved. It's exactly the, you know, it, he is merciful in withholding uh, quite often. You know, that, that is, we can't, we can't accuse him and, and, and be vague about it. We have to assert, God, you're righteous. When you say that's wrong, you are right. That is wrong. And the judgment that you say comes from that, that's absolutely right. You're right to judge sin that way. We agree with God. That is, that is the first step of repentance for ourselves and on behalf of others as Daniel is praying. Uh, Daniel, like I said, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to draw, you, draw your attention to this as much as possible. Daniel identifies with the people and says, we have sinned. And I, again, we don't see in, in the record of his life any aspect where he had disobeyed the word of the Lord. But he claims this as entirely as his own. Lord, we have sinned. We deserve your judgment. And confess the hardness of heart. So many times right here he says, you sent your prophets. You gave us your word. We didn't listen. We didn't hear. We didn't obey. Confess the hardness of heart. If, if someone right now has attracted your attention or a group of people have attracted your attention about the sin that they're in, the path that they're following, and you want to pray for them, there's been a warning that they've ignored. Uh, most people have some access to the Bible. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans of the, the law of God that's written in our hearts uh, that we know right from wrong. Just the, the most generality, there, there is... There is a way of, of uh, a natural conscience, a natural law that people have to disobey to end up in the sin that they end up in. But particularly if you're praying for uh, Christians who have been exposed to the truth and have rejected it, they know the word. And, they, but it's, it's, and it's, it's, what I'm encouraging you to is we have this example of a man who said, we have sinned. We have a hard heart. We've not listened, even though his own life, he had. He had listened to the Lord. He had followed the Lord. Uh, that is his, his prayer from verses 1 through 14. I'm going to read again verses 15 through 19, which focuses us on the answer. He must uh, throw himself on God because he will answer with mercy. Uh, the, this is a specific request. Now, O Lord, our God, who brought... At, your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and, our, and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to the, all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the, the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay, but because your city and your people bear your name. Um, the story is told of Napoleon when he had went uh, when he had uh, graduated from general to emperor, uh, which uh, was you know, quite, quite the grandiose uh, step. Um, he uh, had a soldier who had, had earned the death penalty. It wasn't hard to earn the death penalty as a soldier. You know, uh, time of war, you need everyone to obey orders exactly. I'm not sure exactly what the guy's uh, error was, but he, he had earned the death penalty. And his... It was a situation where the mother could come and plead for 
for her son. So she came and she pleaded for the life of her son. She asked for uh, the great emperor to show mercy. And Napoleon said, your son deserves to die. This is justice. And the mother said, I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. And mercy is the, the, a way to overlook what is deserved uh, is, is part of the example. But it's also implicit in the idea of mercy that it's, it's requested. Don't just go through life randomly bestowing mercy on people who are unaware for the entirety of, of, the, of the time. The, the implication is I need mercy and I need to ask Ask the one who would judge me otherwise for that mercy. <clears throat> God um, makes many provisions for mercy, uh, but mercy implies that it is invited, not merely bestowed. Daniel asked God for that mercy. Turn away your wrath. Rescue your name and people because you are merciful. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Let the wicked forsake his way and their unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. <clears throat> the most keen illustration that comes to my mind about the idea of mercy, and I have no idea if this is real or not, but I've heard the story that uh, uh, a hunter one time was out uh, <clears throat> walking and he, he heard a bunch of dogs barking very clearly. They were hunting down something. Uh, and the noise was getting closer and there was a rustle and, and all these things. And all of a sudden, uh, out, out pops a deer just right in front of him, full and falls at his feet, just desperately lying there as if you're my only hope. And this hunter who, you know, had no moral qualms about killing animals because that was what he was out there to do. When he was faced with a situation where some, uh, uh, this animal had thrown itself on his mercy and the dogs were getting closer and closer, he, he, he bundled up, up the little deer and, and fought off the dogs and kept them away because it was just a, a natural response in that situation to show mercy to something that was helpless. Um, <clears throat> God is so much better than us, so much higher, so much more merciful, so much more loving, so much kinder. Um, we don't need to convince him to do good to people, but we need to ask him. Because if nobody asks for mercy, there will be no mercy. The example that comes to mind on that is, if you recall, uh, Abraham, when his nephew Lot, he knew had, lived, had moved towards Sodom. And God reveals to Abraham his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham push, uh, requests of the Lord, would, would, you, would you destroy it for, for 100? Would, would you just, and the Lord says, oh, I wouldn't destroy it if there were 100 righteous there. What if, what if there were, were 50? I wouldn't des destroy it for 50. If there were 50 righteous in the middle, I wouldn't destroy it. And um, I'm sorry if I've messed up the numbers, but he gets, he gets asked of the Lord, would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there were 10 righteous people there? The Lord said, I wouldn't destroy it if there were 10 righteous people there. And that's where Abraham stops praying. And it turns out there were less than 10 righteous people there. But God hears the prayer and rescues uh, Lot and his wife and two daughters from that, those, those cities that were due to be destroyed. <laughs> Had Abraham not asked, we wouldn't have learned that God was willing to show mercy for someone asking. And we, uh, we come to what, what God is, is intended to do, what, uh, what God has intended to do, we need to ask him to do on this earth uh, and give him the opportunity to show mercy because otherwise he stands as the judge. And I ask you, who comes to mind uh, as needing God's mercy? Uh, will you, before God, stand at their side and ask, Lord, deliver us? This approach can be traced through many of the revivals and awakenings recorded in church history. Ireland has seen many sins through its days, 
But in recent years, we've also become importers and innovators uh, regarding sin and their new categories. If Daniel's example strikes a chord in your heart, I encourage you to intercede for this people, this land, and ask that God show mercy by turning us from our wickedness to his righteousness. And as we close, we must depend on the preparation of God because he will answer with mercy. God sent Gabriel with an answer immediately. And God's plan for Israel would unfold, showing his mercy by bringing the Messiah. As this prophecy pertains to the entire prophetic calendar, I'm not going to delve into it right now, but the point is, Daniel asked for the, the Israel who had been scattered and Jerusalem that had been judged to be, receive God's mercy. And God said, here's my plan for the mercy. Here's exactly what I'm going to do. He gives it in years. Um, the uh, 69 sevens are 483 years, and that's from Artaxerxes' reign when he commands Nehemiah to rebuild uh, the temple, and that lines up with you know 483 later, uh, 83 year later, the years later, the coming of Christ uh, and his sacrifice. Uh, the books and theological debate are what happens to the last seven. The point is, when Daniel asked about Jerusalem and Israel, God said, here's the plan. He immediately had an answer of mercy, an answer of deliverance. Um, okay. And there's, in, just in the next chapter, there's a, something similar. Daniel starts praying and the answer is sent right away. But Daniel ends up praying for 21 days. And the, the, the angel then, then comes to him and says, as soon as you asked, I was sent, just like this one with Gabriel. But the prince of Persia uh, resisted me. So there was, there was an interaction in the spiritual realm that stopped the answer from coming right away. And Michael had to come and help, help this angel uh, to be delivered from the Prince of Persia so he could deliver his message to Daniel, and that's what happened. Uh, but what, as I challenge you to intercede to God for others, um, you, you need to do it because God will answer with mercy. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God has made for provision to show mercy in Christ and already loves the ones you pray for. You're not twisting his arm or introducing a new idea. God already wants to show the mercy and by identifying with the offending group and depending on him for mercy, you open a door for him to do so. Uh, you also recognize that the group is not the enemy. The enemy is Satan with his principalities and powers. The intercessor pleads to God for people, they being either unwilling or unable to plead for themselves. Your plea is for mercy, for they have chosen to reject God and his grace. You plead for mercy while battling the wicked one, applying uh, the victory and authority of Calvary to this, uh, in this situation and casting down the works of darkness. Then ask God to make the ones prayed for willing to cast themselves upon him. Your role is to stand in the gap. Be the one with faith so God can, God's will can be done on earth as it already is in heaven. He has the plan. Be the conduit that lets heaven interact with earth. The intercessor prays to God against Satan for people. Will you stand with people? Who came to mind that you should pray for? What, what, what group? Is it, is it this church? Is it churches in Ireland? Is it the church in general? There's a lot of sin in churches. There's a lot of sin in our nation. There's, a lot, there's sin in our area. That although, by the grace of God, I'm not there I'm not doing that sin. I could be. But will I, will I set aside my privileges and pray as if one of them, as if deserving the, the, the penalty for that sin, saying, Lord, deliver us.